temperature, but people still have problems with their plants, and plants die and get sick and get diseases, and most people never even knew that. I bet you've never heard of plant pathology before you, know, you started this program, almost. Of course, it's not the greatest cocktail party you know, talk. Of, what do you do for a living? Oh, I identify fungus. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not the, but it's really fun. It's really interesting. It's, it's a real key part of nature. None of us would be here also without fungi. But sometimes things go a little wrong and you get, and you get sick plants. So, um, any, and you probably figured out by now, anything can cause a plant to be sick. You know, whether it's the soils, the temperature, all, you know, just about anything can make a plant sick, and what you have to do is try to figure out what it, what little, what all of the many factors that are involved, what causes, the, what interacted to cause a problem on the plant, and sometimes you don't have many clues to go on. You know, the homeowner's not, you know, you you've got a call or you've got a person standing there with a leaf, and you're going, well. <laughs> I can't even tell what plant it is, so I'm not real sure here. But, um, so you've got to you've got to put these things together and come up with a, a real reason why this is happening. And um, it's the most so to me, it's the most challenging of all the agricultural sciences. But that makes it the most fun. So well, so we're going to talk about um, and I just and I've thrown in a lot of little extra pictures along here. Um, like that one is blue mold on citrus. You, you've probably all seen a moldy orange or two. And um, that is a disease that they work really, really hard to control in the packing houses, you know, with chlorine in the water and, and everything so that when the fruit gets to you, it's, it's clean and it lasts up well. All right. Um, the study of plant diseases. Now, most plant pathologists are in the research mode. They're at a university, you know, like Mark Hoddle that you just saw. In the, he's not a plant pathologist, he's an entomologist, but most of them are working at universities or in seed companies or pesticide companies. Um, what, there aren't a whole lot of us in diagnostics, so that's what all we're going to talk about today. And um, most of us are working for regulatory purposes, for protection of the environment, and certification of health for movement of plant material. You probably know San Diego County has the most nurseries of any other county in the whole United States. And yeah, and um, it's a billion dollar industry. And um, we need to protect it, but also we need to improve both of the things coming in from foreign countries because nurseries are always looking for the newest, coolest thing, you know, the pink variety, the yellow variety whatever, so they're always bringing in plant material, and it has to be clean so that we don't have any of these escapees causing problems, and when they sell it and they ship it somewhere else, it doesn't escape and cause problems for someone else either. So we're, we're constantly working on that. We have two dog teams who work at the FedEx, the um, UPS, the post office, early in the morning to um, while they're doing the sorts, so that to make sure that incoming material isn't being shipped in via those routes. So they're very happy little dogs because they're very busy. <laughs> Actually, they're big black labs. And, um, and also improved growth and appropriate treatment for the grower. Most of the people that bring in samples to me, the, the regular homeowners, um, They've already tried everything that the big box store has to sell. They said, well, I've sprayed it with all of these things. And you know what you just bought? You bought 12 different insecticides and sprayed it, and your problem is a fungus. Mm -hmm. So a correct <laughs> diagnosis is very helpful. Or the problem is, you know, soil. Your soil's salty, and all the, everything you sprayed on it doesn't work. And um, so a correct diagnosis both helps get the problem solved and protects the environment from all kinds of other things that people are doing. So, um, first you need a definition of a disease. What is a disease? And so I'm calling it, there are many, you know, there's probably as many definitions of diseases as there are people who work on diseases. And that includes the medical profession, especially the medical profession. But what I'm calling it here is a harmful alteration of normal development. And it's a complex interaction that occurs over time. So that's a disease. If you've got something like somebody sprayed it with a chemical and it fried, that's a that's a different thing. So, 
Um, it's not a disease. It's, it's usually caused by a living organism. So something that can reproduce in the host. And so I snuck in apple scab, another fungus. That, um, it's particular, that you see it pretty common on Anna apples here. And that's the, the black stuff right there is the fungus, Venturia NA qualis. And it's that second name, the, the species name NNA qualis means um, when you see the spores, it's two cells, and the, the cells are different sizes. So they're unequal in size. <laughs> so, it, yeah, it is Latin, but sometimes there's a pattern to it that we can figure out. Uh, you need a little bit of vocabulary, too, because when you're reading all of your stuff, you're going, what the heck is chlorosis? And why don't they just say yellowing? But that's what they did. Chlorosis means yellowing of normally green tissue. Necrosis is death. The, de the tissue is dead. Um, and then sign and symptom. A sign is the actual pathogen or its parts seen on that plant, like on the previous picture with the apple scab, that black stuff is the actual fungus fruiting. So that would be a sign. A symptom is a visible alteration as a result of the disease. That's like the leaves turn yellow and the leaves turn chlorotic. So that is a symptom, or you know, the plant is wilting. That is a symptom, not a, not a sign. So what, when you're trying to talk to somebody and figure out what their problem is, you're trying to get from them, they say, it looks bad. Okay, how does it look bad? You know, is it dying back from the tips? Is it yellow? Is it brown? You try to get more specific out of them about what is actually going on there. Um, the disease triangle. Every, every plant pathologist is going to hit you with the disease triangle. And that's the host, the pathogen, and the environment. And those things depend, create the amount of disease that you're going to get. So I think, I always figure it as the host plant, that's the plant, is always out there. The pathogens are always out there, blowing in the wind, residing in the soil, they're there. It's what you do with the environment that makes, that's the only thing that we have a lot of control over that makes the disease or not. So, okay, when, I, when somebody brings me in a sample and I'm going, okay, you, you got to try to figure out what's going on. Your first step is to figure out what's the plant. Because, you know, many of these diseases that we're talking about are really specific to their host. So if you know what the host is, that really helps you figure out what's going on with the plant. So what is the plant and... It's hard, you know, there, you, as you know, there's lots of different kinds of plants out there, and the sample that you get is often very small. So you're going, okay, but if you can figure out what the plant is, and then if you can elicit from them what, what else is going on with the plant. Has it been sprayed with anything? What, what kind of soil is it in? Is this a cactus in a heavy clay soil that's watered three times a week? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a really big clue right there in that. Um, so how's it been cared for? Did you do a lot of construction re nearby recently and cut all the roots? Did your neighbor's pool leak and spread chlorine all across your lawn? All of these little things people don't always think to tell you, so just get them talking. And then what, what specific signs and symptoms do you see on the sample? Um, and then I will go to a, whoops, go back. Then I'm going to go to the microscopic exam. A lot of you put it under the microscope and look at it very carefully. And if you can see mites or aphids or anything like that, well, great. Then I can send it to entomology. But <laughs> take it across the cave, take it a few steps over in the lab and go, hey, this one's for you guys. And then they do the same with me. They say, oh, great, because this one's for you. Um, sometimes we have to go to other tests. We'll culture it. We have. Um, kind of dipstick tests for Phytophthora that you just grind up the roots and put them in this buffer with the roots and it's like a pregnancy test kit. You get a line that says, okay, we have Phytophthora here. Um, for confirmation of very exotic things, um, a lot of them need DNA testing. And we send that all up to the state lab in Sacramento. Um, we don't do it for normal homeowner samples. We only do it for exotic things, rated pests, this rating back here is assigned by the state, and that tells us what you do with it. An A-rated pest means, ooh, this is a bad one. 
this is a pest of quarantine significance um, or something like that so all of those before we go into somebody's nursery and start destroying their crop because they've got an A-rated pest we get everything confirmed by the state lab sometimes the federal lab we had one in December that went to both the state and the federal lab for confirmation before we went into the poor guy's nursery and had to destroy some of his plants so yeah that, you know, you don't want, you can't let these things spread sometimes when they're very bad and very exotic. And you've probably all seen wilting Phoenix canariensis trees, where the, the branches are dying back prematurely. You've got one-sided browning on a frond. Um, that's fusarium wilt. It's a fungus, and once it's in your soil, it's there forever. You will never ever get rid of it, but it's fairly host specific only to phoenix trees. So at least you can't plant another phoenix palm in that in that spot, but you could plant another tree. But so once you get a lot of these things, they are there forever. You you don't have Mark Hoddle's lovely story of Tahiti where you finally got rid of something. We don't get that very often. So okay, things that cause diseases can be living things or dead things. So, or, well, non-living things. Um, non-living things are, another name for them is abiotic. And um, I should put that as disorder. Sorry, that it's not really a disease, it's a disorder because it's caused by a non-living thing. But anyway, things that cause plant problems can, um, that are non-infectious, they don't spread by themselves um, include environmental stress, nutrient deficiencies, chemical damage, air pollution, things like that. Non-living things. And um, one of these physiological things that happen, that's a geranium leaf, and you might have all seen that kind of brown callus tissue on the back of the, of the leaf, and that's edema. Plants cool themselves, you know, they heat and they cool themselves by opening up their pores and letting water evaporate. And this occurs under conditions of high humidity and rapid temperature change. Like in the morning when you've got morning fog or your sprinklers go off, so your humidity is really high. And then the sun comes out, the fog burns off, the sun comes out suddenly, and the temperature zooms. And so the plant goes, okay, I've got to cool myself down. It opens up its pores and it's trying to evaporate water off to cool itself but the humidity is still really high, so it can't. And all those cells are just full of water, and they pop. That's what it is. That's, that's what causes this kind of damage. So they just break. OK, another thing, um, nutrient deficiencies. One that we don't see a lot of here, but it's kind of important for another disease we're going to talk about later. Um, because the symptoms some people think are, they see this and they go, I've got that evil disease. No, 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 you've got a zinc deficiency or an iron deficiency or a potassium deficiency, but that one's zinc deficiency on citrus. And they're usually um, fairly symmetrical. You know, it's one side of the leaf matches the other side of the leaf. If you had asymmetrical yellowing, like the, where the parts didn't match, then we get worried. But we'll talk about that. You want to guess what that one is? Fungus? Now we're still on abiotic problems. Fertilizer. It's the fertilizer, yeah. <laughs> so these parts got the fertilizer, this part they missed the line. <laughs> so it can be just something as simple as that. And the pattern in the line will tell you, will, um, will really help, which you don't always see when they bring in a little sample, they brought in that little sample of yellow leaf and they're going, uh, I don't know, but if you saw that pattern, then you go, oh, there's something abiotic going on here, that's not a natural pattern. There's something, so then you start asking questions, did you spray it with anything? Did you treat it with anything? What did you put on that grass? So, okay, here's, an, here's another one. You might have seen this on your rose bush, kind of stunted, the leaves are kind of strap like That one's um, same thing, but on blackberry. Stunted leaves, narrow, skinny little leaves. Um, part of the bush is fine, part of it isn't. 
short internode growth. So you want to take a guess? Okay. Um, a hint under here. Um, you see nice clean soil with no Bermuda grass or crab grass or anything growing right under the bush. Round up injury. The whole rose family, apples, you know, roses, berries, they're all very susceptible to round up. A breath of it can do this to your roses. So um, another thing to watch out for. And, and homeowners never forget, they hardly ever remember to tell you that, that, you know, we, oh yeah, we spray Roundup for that, and they don't even realize, oh yeah, that's a pesticide. <laughs> so if you ask, did you use, did you use any pesticides around there? No, but that's, that's Roundup injury. So that one actually came from a grower who couldn't figure it out. He was like, <laughs> no, I didn't spray him with anything, but you sprayed some weeds nearby. And a little bit of drift will do that to members of the Rose family. So, okay, here's another hard one. <laughs> These are African violets, you know, a tropical fuzzy leaf. Tropical plant, so it likes warm temperatures, fuzzy leaf. Water damage. Water damage. Water damage. Cold water damage. Yeah. It looks like a virus at first. You're going, wow, look, look at those classic ring spots. Really nice. But that's cold water damage when they get sprinkled with cold water in the morning. In a very cold morning. So, all right. So those were examples of disorders, non-living things. All right, here are um, diseases caused by living things. And that one's one thing that I, I just read a whole a few samples of those this morning. Nematodes. That's a um, lesion nematode, a crabolinchus that lives in plant tissue. It, it moves around from plant to plant to plant. It's, it's called a migratory endoparasite, meaning mo it spends most of its life in the tissue, just cruising around, killing cells, making little holes that fungi can get in and cause root rot. Uh, nematodes have a stylet. It's kind of like what we, she was talking about this morning with the glossy wing sharpshooter. It's got a mouth part that it sticks into a plant cell and sucks the juice out. Um, little tiny, again, these are very tiny, these are microscopic, you can't see them with the naked eye. But um, that's what it does. Some of the nematodes actually spread viruses, too. So, um, if you're going to be starting an orchard or a vineyard, I would get it checked for nematodes first to find out what's going on there. But, so we do a, quite a few numbers of nematodes. Um, other things, viroids, found only in plants, viruses, bacteria, fungi, all living things that cause plant diseases. So we're, just, we're kind of going to work up the scale here. We're starting with the very smallest, smallest of, or, of organisms. Um, so submicroscopic means you can't see it even with a regular microscope. You've got to go to an electron microscope. And um, these are viroids. And there is no hu animal equivalent, human or animal equivalent of them. These things only exist in plants, and they're just complicated little bits of tiny, twisted up naked RNA. And they get put into, um, they get moved into a cell with a vector of some kind. Now that could be your 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 um, knife. You know, if you're your grafting knife, it can be various insects. Um, they are, of course, parasites since they have no cell of their own, and they're really there's no spray to, to control them. Pretty much, if you've got it, you probably want to get rid of the plant. And the one that we see here for, um, every now and then is when a home gardener grafted a new variety of avocado onto their old rootstock or their old tree that. Um, has been doing fine for years and they never see it, but then they graft a new variety on there and all of a sudden it's doing this. That one's cut open, just to show you. The tissue underneath isn't too badly affected, but it looks ugly. You know, you can still eat them, they're still edible, but they're not really saleable. And um, that's called avocado sunblotch and it's caused by a viroid. And that's probably the only one that you will ever see here, which is good. Okay, we're going to move up to viruses. Viruses are, again, very tiny things. You can't see them with the naked eye. You have to use an electron microscope to see them. 
and um, some, they're, they come in many sizes and shapes. You've got fairly big ones, Those are, that's a clostral virus, and um, it looks like a plate of spaghetti. That's basically what they, they're long, they're loopy. Um, this is tobacco mosaic virus, which is a rigid rod. And that was the first virus ever discovered, just so you know, and, and ever characterized. And it was a plant virus. <laughs> and then we have the Gemini viruses. These are all, these are either white fly or leaf hopper transmitted. And um, they come in their um, icosahedron, a multi sided particle that sort of looks round. And they come in pairs, always. That's why the name Gemini. The twins, they always come in pairs. So they come in, so anyway, they come in many sizes and shapes. You, you don't have to, it doesn't really, you don't have to remember what size or shape it is exactly. Um, and they're, they're mostly, cat, well, we categorize them by families. Um, so whatever family they're in, because you can't remember all of the names. There are thousands of different plant viruses, you know, tobacco mosaic, tristaza, citrus tristaza. You know, there, there are a lot of tomato mosaic. There are thousands of them out there. But they're easier to remember if you can remember them based on their family. Just like we remember plant families, you know, the rose family has various, various characteristics. Well, the same with the virus families. So um, this one has put tomato growers out of business. Tomato spotted wilt virus. It's it's thrips transmitted. You know, all those fields of, around Carlsbad where Legoland is now and everything they used to be tomato fields everywhere. And guess what virus helped put them out of business? Tomato spotted wilt. So um, citrus tristaza virus is a clostero virus. Clostero is a, I think it's a Greek word for spindle. Yeah. If they were the same family, that first bunya. Uh huh. The bunya viridae. Yeah. That suggests, I, I mean, patient to shade tomato with sun, so you never want to put it together. But would there be a connection there? Would yeah. The virus can move yes. more easily. From Yes, yeah, that'll, some of them have, have, will go into other hosts within, mm -hmm. actually, um, it, it used to be all spotted wilt virus, and then they figured out that impatience necrotic spot virus was a very closely related virus, but they, they were two different things. They did used to be all tomato spot, spotted wilt virus. And patients' necrotic spot is important to all our nurseries with greenhouses because you get a thrips infestation in the greenhouse and they all go crazy. So um, causes it can cause big problems. Cucumber mosaic, and some of these are named for the, the first plant that it was ever described on. Cucumo, cucumber mosaic for the mo. So that's where same with the tobamo viruses, tobacco mosaic. That's how they got their name. So they're trying to clue you in, even though it's a mouthful to say all the time. <laughs> so um, a butylon mosaic was also in the nursery trade about 20 years ago. It was really um, being propagated like crazy because they had a new, what they thought was a new variety, a variegated variety of a butylon. And the leaves had all these weird, funny, bright yellow patterns on them. And in the end, they figured out it was really due to a butylon mosaic virus and those what they thought were new varieties have all disappeared now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Viruses, again, they don't have legs. They can't crawl. They can't swim. So they need something to move them around on. So they're going to be moving around on seeds. Some of them are seed transmitted. Some of them blow in the wind on pollen. That's a big problem for trees like walnuts. Things like that are um, they're pollen transmitted, and of course they're insect transmitted, like on this white fly here, as some of those Gemini viruses are. Um, mites transmit a few of them. Um, let's see what else. Uh, of course, nematodes. Some of them are fungal transmitted, and a lot of them are transmitted mechanically, like on your cutting knives or pruning tools. Uh, things like that, or just handling them. Tobacco mosaic is a tough enough virus that you touch one plant that's got it, and you go touch another plant that's got that's clean. You just transmitted it. 
It's a, it's a very tough little virus. It, it, in every smoker, pretty much, if you're smoking cigarettes, you've got tobacco mosaic on your hands. So just, just to warn you, our, a lot of our nurseries that our inspectors go to are like, do you smoke? Okay, you, then you have to wear gloves in our nursery and things like that. So cleanliness is really important. Okay, symptoms, what, cause, what does a viral infection look like? Could be nothing. There are lots of symptomless hosts of things. Some of them don't do very much. Some of, most, a lot of them make a mosaic or model. That's rose mosaic there. Now there's no one virus that's rose mosaic. They've really divided it up now into several different viruses. So there's no rose mosaic anymore. But um, they've renamed all of the different things that cause that. But it's really easy to say, okay, that, that symptom is rose mosaic. That disease is rose mosaic anyway. Um, so they'll cause a leaf spot. They'll cause stunting or yield loss. That's very important in, in food crops like potatoes. You might not see symptoms, but all of a sudden where you were getting, you know, a larger tonnage per acre, you're down. You're way down. You'll get half of your crop that you should have got. Um, they can cause deformations, and sometimes they actually cause plant death. Um, just as an example, here's our impatience necrotic spot virus on cyclamen. It, it doesn't kill the plant, but if that's the plant in your nursery and you're trying to sell it, how much money are you going to get for that with the leaves looking like that? No, it doesn't kill the plant, but it causes an economic loss for the nursery. Um, tomato yellow leaf curl vi Gemini virus. Virus is a, it's an A-rated pest in California. When you, when you see that one and you get it confirmed, um, that plant is going to go away. But you can't really miss it. It's, it's, it looks like it got sprayed with herbicide. It's bright yellow. The leaves are curled and stunted and twisted and, and um, the veins are still green. See, you got the twisting. This one you're not going to get a yield off anyway. So it's white fly transmitted. We have had outbreaks of that in the desert areas of Imperial and Riverside counties. We've never found it in San Diego County yet. But we know these things are out there sometimes. So we're always looking for cool stuff. All right, we're going to move up the scale a little bit here now to a real cell, to bacteria. And um, a lot of human pathogens are caused by bacteria, but not so many plant pathogens, thank goodness. Um, this is a leaf right here, and if you're really lucky, someday it's under the microscope, and you think you've got a bacterial problem, you make a fresh cut in a leaf across the veins, and you put it under the microscope, and you see this bacterial streaming. That's all the bacteria coming out of the vascular tissue of the plant. And it's like, it's very cool to see. <laughs> it's like, and, it's, and it's an easy diagnostic tool. It's like, okay, I know what, what's going on here now. We, we've got some bacteria going. So one of the really common ones, the, the, probably the most common in San Diego County, um, bacterial disease is fire blight of flowering pear caused by Erwinia amylabra. It's named after a guy who first described it named Erwin. So that's where that comes from. And you've probably all seen this on your flowering pears, maybe a little on Photinia. It only goes to members of the rose family. So if people are bringing in their tomato going, I've got fire blight, I've got that disease, I looked it up, it looks like this, you're going, no. <laughs> no, it really doesn't go to our, our regular rose bushes anymore. You know, they've been hybridized, so that they're resistant to it. But um, you still see it, flowering pear is the big one, and a few other members of the rose family, you'll see it once in a while. This one is spread by honeybees. The bacteria are in the flower, and they're on the, um, the new growth. They like to hang out in the new tissue. And so when a bee is visiting a flower, it's going to, it gets the bacteria on its body, it goes to the next plant and infects, and that's why you um, usually see it infecting right where the flower bud used to be, where it starts. And it works its way back. On the east coast, it'll, it can kill trees. Here, it hardly ever does. Our weather is, a, is much drier. That hot, dry weather that we have all summer dries up bacteria. They don't grow as well. So you'll get all this constant dieback 
on the flowering pear trees, on the susceptible flowering pears. So your best controls is they do breed plants that are resistant to the disease now. So that is the best control because chemicals don't work so well on it. And then what we started talking about this morning, Xylella fastidiosa is a bacteria. We're talking about very, very tiny bacteria now. Again, these are things that you can't see under the microscope. Um, but this is, this is an important one because it's changing. When the glassy wing sharpshooter got here, it brought different strains of the disease. They're all Xylola fastidiosa, but there are different strains now that we never used to have here. And um, they're causing a few problems for us. But this is where we first <coughs> noticed that things were different. When all of the vineyards in Temecula started looking like this about 1990, 1992. That's the bacterium itself right there in an electron micrograph. Very tiny little guys, but they cluster together, they clump, and they plug up the vascular tissue of the plant so water doesn't get through. So the symptoms look like drought stress, heat stress, you know, the edges of the, of the leaves get brown, dry. And you're going, is it getting enough water? See again there, the, the water's not getting from the roots up to the top of the plant, so all of the minerals and everything aren't working right, so it looks like it's got nutrient deficiency. Again, those leaf edges burned, burned, burned. Um, and this is what happened to whole vineyards up in Temecula there. So um, it, was, it was very bad. Now, fortunately, we have learned how to live with it in grapes. And we also have a big program here because this insect is pretty much relegated to Santa Barbara County and south in California. There have been a few outbreaks in other places, but they stomp on them really hard <laughs> and um, break them down because you don't want the insect because it's such a good vector of the disease spreading around the country. So we have a big program here for the glassy wing sharpshooter inspection before any nursery is shipping nursery stock out to an area that does not want glassy wing sharpshooter, um, they have to be inspected leaf by leaf. You know, look at the whole thing very carefully for those tiny little egg masses. Because that's how it's getting around on the egg masses, on the leaves. Yeah? Pat, last year we had a, a huge die off of all the white oleander. Mm -hmm. Was that caused by the? Yes. That's the xylella. And if you notice, if you drive up north on the I-15, in the, you know, in the median, all the oleander in there is signed, that's oleander scorch disease. What about the red oleanders? Didn't seem to be, what was, what, at least I was told that and I noticed that. I don't know. I know they'll get it too, eventually. They may be somewhat more resistant. She's talking about, you know, oleander getting, getting xylella scorch disease. So in, in, so in grapes, the same bacterium is called Pierce's disease, and it was named after the first plant pathologist in California sent out by the USDA to, to look at this. They also called it Anaheim disease because there were vineyards all over Anaheim at that time. So he came to Orange County, and his name was Pierce. So they named it after him. Yes? Is someone trying to breed an oleander that resisted? I don't know. Good question. I don't know. I know they're working really, really hard on grapes. And are they bringing in wasps to try to get rid yeah, of them? Yeah, they're already here. They were, they were established a while back. Do, no, we, not, do we not have enough wasps? And that's why it's killing all It the doesn't work as well as it does on the, the island of Tahiti here. <laughs> Darn it! We wish. Plus, um, for bacterial control to establish and keep going, you've always in order for the wasp to survive, there's always a little reservoir of insects somewhere. Now it only takes one insect, one sharpshooter, to transmit the disease. So um, biological control of the insect in cases like this do not help very much with the disease. Because only those few sharpshooters that are left just go from plant to plant to plant and can spread the disease really rapidly. So now in the vineyards, they've worked on controlling it. They found also that the glassy wing sharpshooter was overwintering on the citrus. Now if you notice in the Ralph Temecula, you've got a citrus grove next to a vineyard, and the glassy wing sharpshooters were overwintering on the citrus in there and building up very high populations. And then in the spring, when the grape leaves started coming out, but the sharpshooter said, hmm, we're bored with citrus, we want new food. And they would move over to the grapevines 
and phew, you know they transmitted the disease like crazy. So they have they fig also figured out that you need to if you're going to grow a vineyard next to citrus, you have to control the sharpshooters in the citrus in the winter time. So as well as then spraying for the citrus, what they're doing now is one spray a year in May, and that seems to control it enough so that they can still grow their vineyards. So yeah. I've noticed in the vineyard, they often have been a rose bush. Is that a way to monitor the infestation of insects, the bacteria? Um, that's an old-fashioned way to monitor powdery mildew. So when the rose gets powdery mildew, then you've got to spray your, your grapevines for powdery mildew. And they still do it, you know, everywhere. And certainly it's in France, it's in Bordeaux. I went there and took pictures of them, <laughs> of the rose bushes on the ends of the rose. It's not the same fungus that causes the powdery mildew on the roses as on the grapes, but the conditions for both diseases are the same, the environmental conditions. So when, they, when you see it on your roses, they know to spray it on the grapes. But that was the old way they did it. Now it's much more, okay, we've got a schedule for our pesticide applications, and it's monitored by computers. You enter your... Um, data in every day, your temperature and your water data in every day, and, and the computer tells you, okay, it's time to spray now that conditions are right. They've got computer models for that now. But in the old days, it was the rose bush. And so they just keep planting rose bushes on the end of vineyards, which is cool. <laughs> um, but so when the glassy wind sharpshooter got here from the southeast U.S., it brought many different strains of the bacteria with it that we had never had before. So we are losing liquid ambers. And so you see the same kind of symptoms, that scorch problem, which could also be high soil salt levels. You know, if somebody dumped a bag of fertilizer under there or they cut the water off. So you got to ask all these questions. Oleander leaf scorch, certainly we're losing lots of oleander. We are losing lots of olive trees. And here the symptoms are more subtle. It's not a, you know, a dramatic scorch. It's maybe a little bit of scorch on the very tip of the leaf, but not so, not so great. It's a, you see it more with a lot of dieback. You know, all of a sudden, you're looking at your olive tree and you see a lot of dieback in it. And if it's not watered, because people love to overwater them too, that's the first thing I always ask, because an olive, you know, is a Mediterranean plant. And so if you overwater it, it's going to get root rot, it's going to get verticillium wilt. But if they are not watering it so much, and you, and you still and it's still dying back, then only under scorch is a strong possibility. We're we're losing a lot of olive trees here. We're losing a lot of the purple leaf plums due to this disease also. So and who knows which woody host it's going to go to next, or if a new strain got here too. Um, this is one that is not here yet, but it's in Brazil. It's Citrus variegated chlorosis, but it is also another strain of Xylella. So the poor citrus growers are getting hammered, man. They're, they're, there's so many threats out there to get at them. Um, but once you've already got the vector here, you, you want to be really careful about keeping vigilant for the disease. Because your only hope with things like this is to find it early, early, early before it's spread and eradicate it right then. So, okay, that leads us to the other, <laughs> the worst disease of citrus there is in the world, and um, which is the, the Chinese name is Guanlong Bing, caused by the bacterium, again, Liberobacter asiaticus. And it's very much the same model as the Pierce's disease. It's a, a mic very, very tiny, submicroscopic bacterium transmitted by an insect. In this case, the insect is the Asian citrus psyllid. And the bacterium, in this case, lives in the phloem, the food-carrying system of the plant. The xylella, before, carries is in the xylem, the water-carrying system. So you see those scorch symptoms. With this one, it's disrupting the sugar supply, the food supply within the plant. So the symptoms are going to be a little different. Um, trees might be stunted. They might be yellow on one side. See, the side's not growing as well. Um, so that's a tree in Florida. We have had one instance of the disease in California before. This is um, the leaves from that tree in Hacienda Heights in the Los Angeles area. So 
Hopefully, we never find it again. But yeah, they said on NPR this morning that they they're spraying residential in Riverside County to th this week as a preventative measure since it hasn't been found there yet. What are they spraying it with? They are spraying insecticide for the psyllid. Yeah. The populations in Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties, the populations of the citrus really exploded this summer. Just huge, huge, very, very bad infestations of the psyllid. So they're trying to knock that back a little bit. And um, we have it in this county. We found it first on the border in 2008. As a matter of fact, if we keep going. Um, anyway, we found the psyllid. It's it's all over. It's pretty much all over the county now. But it was pretty much south of the I-8 before, and um, then those infestations in Los Angeles and um, Riverside counties blew up, and it came down <laughs> to our citrus growing region from the north. So um, now we've got it in Oceanside, Escondido, Valley Center, in our citrus growing part of the, of the county, which we hadn't had before. Psyllid. Yes. But just because you have the psyllid doesn't mean you have the disease. disease. Correct. Correct. So far, other than that one tree in, La in Los Angeles County, we have not found the disease anywhere. We're looking. We're looking very hard. We're cross-training everybody who goes into the field to you know, recognize the symptoms. Yes, Scott? Obvious, yeah. Well, um, since the disease does not occur, well, in California anyway, someone smuggled cuttings in from somewhere else and grafted them onto this person's tree. She it was her gardener. It was a, a older lady, and um, he, she had a gardener who was. He, she just let him do whatever he wanted, and he was grafting different varieties, and they were on this one tree. There were over 20 different grafts. He was just grafting different varieties willy-nilly, and apparently they were part of a church group garden club. And um, this guy was doing this to other people's in the church group's trees. And <laughs> so, yeah, he was... He's, somebody smuggled, we can't say who, because we can't prove it, but somebody smuggled in cuttings and grafted infected disease plant material and engrafted it onto a tree. Yeah. What insecticide do you use? Do they use? They use um, imidacloprid, which is a systemic that goes into the soil, and then they also use a contact to hit, you know, knock it back immediately, and then the imidacloprid um, keeps it, controls it for a little longer. Yeah, it gives you longer term control. And it's been very successful. At least down on the border where they've used it, it's worked really, really well, keeping the psyllid population down, down, down. So, because they were very concerned about trucks coming up from Mexico. Mexico has the problem too. They have the disease and they have the insect. So they were very concerned about insects and plant material coming up from Mexico that way. And that, so spraying plants along the border there was working really well until the psyllid got back here from Los Angeles. So, but anyway, this is what happens if you're in an orchard, the trees all start dropping their fruit. Um, it's called citrus greening because the fruit never greens up properly, or it stays green, I mean. It never colors up properly. The fruit is asymmetrical. It's not even anymore. It's... It's just odd, and it tastes, they tell me, like turpentine. <laughs> it, it ruins the taste because it's, it's impacting the sugar transport system in the plant. The sugar is not moving properly, so it doesn't move into the fruit properly. So it, it's worthless. And um, you have asymmetrical yellowing of the leaves. <coughs> so, you know, one, light, one side might be green, one side might be yellow. Now, there are other things that do this. But if you've got that, and fruit that's not greening, fruit that's dropping, um, oddball-shaped fruit, fewer seeds, a lot of shriveled seeds, then we get very, very worried. <laughs> and we go out and we grab samples and we send them to the state lab in Sacramento. So again, a, another look at the greening thing. This is the bacterium in the phloem vessel. It's a long, skinny thing. That's a cross-section. You know, it's just a, a round little tube, 
I know worm like, but it gets in there and it plugs everything up. This is the adult Asian citrus psyllid. Again, it's the size of an ant. It's really tiny to see. It's got red eyes. And you're always going to find it on the new growth. It, it likes that soft new growth. And it also, like the glassy wing sharpshooter, it moves away from you. If it sees you coming, it moves away to the other side of the, of the stem that it's on, away from you, to make it harder to spot. So it's easier to spot them in the mornings, in the cold mornings, when they're not moving as fast. Same with the glassy wing sharpshooter. Go, if you're looking for them, look for them while it's still cold before they get warmed up in the morning. The eggs are, are tiny little yellow things on the newest growth. And they've already got little red eyes, too. So little red-eyed demons. <laughs> But very hard to spot. When you when you kill a plant or kill a tree with this, how do you do that? Do you have to burn them? Yeah. You can't. Burn well, they them. usually bring in a bulldozer and knock it down, and then they they burn it. They burn it. Yeah. And we've actually, well, in the state, not in this county, but in, Vir in Ventura County, for another bacterial disease called bacterial canker, they caught a guy smuggling plant material in from Japan. I think it was. Mm -hmm. And he was, again, he, and he was taking it back to his private orchard and grafting this diseased plant material onto it. And this is the disease that's spread by rain. You know, in Florida, it goes through with the hurricanes. They came in and they knocked down his whole orchard and burned it. Yeah, it wasn't big, but yeah. These, some of these diseases are very, very serious. And California has a very big citrus industry, and they can ruin it. And the fines for that kind of stuff is pretty big, I would assume. Usually, usually it's just the, you know, the destruction of the orchard they figure is really? bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had two questions. The first one was, for how do you remove oleander spore? Because there's a problem with the nose. How, uh, how, how do you remove oleanders that might get oleander scorch? Is that, you just take them out? Or yeah. Like, just take them out, rip them out by the roots. Yeah. The easy to burn. The, um, that's usually, or landfill. Yeah, depending on, on the size of the tree, or at least that first tree in Los Angeles, they sent that straight up to the lab. They, they pulled that baby out and they put it right in a van and they drove it straight up to the lab so that they could, so that they could do a whole bunch of tests on it just to, to study it because we've never had it before to study. So, yeah. You do composting temperatures to get a little bit Yes. They do. Yes. Okay, so composting compost. would kill it, yeah. And it only, it's only going to move around on the insect. So um, as long as it's buried or composted or mulched, it's not going to move around any other way. Okay, um, that's what's going to happen to your orchard. And it's already happened in Florida, in Louisiana, in Texas. You know, it's, we're the last country in the world to get this disease. It's native to Asia, and um, we're still trying to fight it. So. The, 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 re, the only hope in the long term is going to be resistant varieties, plants that are resistant to the bacteria. And they're working on it. But right, and right now they already have some because there's very little natural resistance in the plant, but they can genetically engineer it to be resistant. So they're talking about that. You know, They've got a gene from spinach that when you put it into citrus, the citrus tree does not get this disease. Now I would happily drink, a, you know, orange juice with a with a spinach gene in it, but it wouldn't bother me. But um, so they're still working all that out. But that's going to be our only hope of long term of homegrown citrus. Once the disease gets here and gets established well, so yeah. So okay, um, I actually I think this might be well. I'll do this one and then we'll stop. Last one before the break. Um, nematodes, we talked about them already briefly. There's an, another, there are quarantine pests of nematodes too. That's a reniform nematode. And I know you can't really tell what they look like from this. But mostly when you're going to see them on a homeowner sample, it's going to be the root knot nematode, and that's what it does to the roots. That's a, that was a tomato plant. And they get knotty, they're galled, they're ugly, they're, they're absolutely useless to the plant and you're not going to get a yield out of that plant. And again, these are things that once they're in your soil, they are there forever. They're not going away. And we used to fumigate soil to control them, and now um, there's very little fumigation done anymore. So they're harder to control. 
What about bacteria and viruses being transmitted into the soil? Does that happen with different nematodes? Will spread viruses? Oh, well, okay. Yes. But anything, any of the other ones that you know your soil is that get into the soil? Um, something like um, crown gall, uh, walnuts, say, or a fruit trees. Crown gall is a bacterial disease that is also soil borne. It lives in the soil forever. And then if the tree gets, it needs a wound to get in though. So if the tree gets wounded somehow, pruning knives, it often happens when, during the grafting process in, in a nursery that's not being really, really clean. Or, um, you know, lawnmower bumps and things like that on a, uh, usually fruit trees stone fruit or nut trees. Okay, so I think this is a good spot. We'll start with the fungi next. Good, good spot to take a break.